One of the prisoners in a German prisoner of war camp tries to escape. He climbs through the barbed wire, but is spotted and shot on the spot. The camp is in France, and German superiors arrive to deal with the aftermath of the recent escape in which the prisoner was killed. Among them there is Major Karl von Steiner. They are met by Colonel Waldron. He is the senior officer in the camp. Major Steiner used to play soccer and was even a member of the German national team. He saw the prisoners playing with a ball in the yard and became interested in the game. He also recognized John Colby, who had played for English club West Ham United before the war. Colby told him that prisoners from different countries were arranging a semblance of international matches. Steiner was captured with the idea of organizing a match between the camp team and the Wehrmacht team. The next day he offered the match to Colby, and the man decided to get the most out of the situation. He arranged with the major that his team would be given the best food, soccer uniforms and boots, and lodged separately. At the same time, he would select the players himself. Steiner agreed to his terms. Colonel Waldron and the other officers were working on a new escape plan. One of the players, Robert Hatch, a Canadian-American, came to him. He suggested an escape from the shower room. The guards, who usually keep an eye on the washers, were not particularly cautious, and Hatch could escape through the vent. His idea was accepted and preparations began. They had to make a passport for Hatch and make up a cover story so that he could move freely around France. Meanwhile, Colby begins the selection process for the team. When he learned that the players would be living in a special position, Hatch wanted to join them, but Colby rejected his nomination. Instead, he took Corporal Luis Fernandez, who had demonstrated his skills. Upon learning of the upcoming game, Waldron calls Colby to him and demands that he run away with the team when they are taken to the stadium. John however is confident that they will all be shot as they try to escape. Steiner reports his idea of playing with prisoners of war to his superiors. And the brass decides it's a great PR. His idea is approved. Steiner summons Colby and tells him that the German national team and the prisoner of war team will play in Paris. This is how the Germans want to get maximum publicity for the event. Colby also makes a condition. There must be Slavs on his team. The Nazis do not consider them human beings and even prisoners of war are kept in concentration camps. Steiner resists, but then he gives up and promises to bring him the Slav players that Colby pointed out to him. Upon learning of the match in Paris, Waldron expressed his displeasure. He is sure that no self-respecting officer would play with the Nazis for the amusement of the German superiors. Meanwhile Hatch is being issued a passport. One of the prisoners of war has assembled a camera from handicrafts and forges the necessary seals. Wait, wait, one more for luck? Yeah. In addition, they got clothes for Hatch and made up a cover story in case he was stopped by a German patrol. However, a new problem arose. The guards, on whose carelessness Hatch had counted, were now assigned to the players. That meant Hatch had to get on the team. Colby reluctantly agreed to accept Hatch. He decided to become a team doctor. After a while, prisoners from other camps are brought in at Colby's request, because they are good players. Everyone is given new uniforms and training begins. These, these, go. Easy. Then the Slav players arrive. They are haggard and unable to stand up straight, let alone play soccer. Colby sends them to the showers and gives them a good meal. During one of the practices, Hatch shows himself to be a pretty good goalkeeper. Colby decides to give him a chance and starts coaching him. Waldron calls Hatch in and asks him to contact the resistance, which is based in Paris. Hatch must organize the soccer team's escape with their help. When the players go to shower, Hatch climbs out through the vent and hides in the next room. At the evening check, they put a puppet in his place, and camp guards didn't suspect a thing. When the order is given to stand down, Hatch, using his Rambo skills, sprints to the gate. Here he hooks onto a car and sneaks out of the camp. From there, he runs into the woods, reaches the train station, and buys a ticket to Paris. There was a woman at the train station with a baby and some suitcases. Hatch helped her carry her bags into the train, and the checking soldiers let him through. Hatch's disappearance was not immediately noticed. During one roll call, the doll's head fell off, and the guards realized something was wrong there. However, Colby got away with it because he had no part in organizing the escape. In Paris, Hatch arrived at a bar where members of the resistance gathered and drew a sign on the table to be identified. The bartender took him to the conspirators who gathered at Renee's apartment. She had lost her husband in the war and now lived with her son. Hatch was made to understand that it was impossible for the team to escape because the players would be heavily guarded. But when the French learned which stadium the game would be played in, they realized that an escape could be arranged through the sewer underneath the stadium. But now the details of the operation had to be communicated to the players, and to do that, Hatch had to return to camp. 
he did not really like the idea. When he allowed himself to be caught, he was sent back to the same camp to show the prisoners that the escape had failed. Colby insisted Hatch be returned to the team as a goalkeeper. He said his goalkeeper had broken his arm and could not play. Steiner agreed, but the player had to be examined by his doctor first. They had to actually break the goalkeeper's arm so that Hatch could return. Once among his own, he told them that they would escape during the match. Finally, game day arrives. The soccer team is taken under heavy security to the train station, and from there they are sent to Paris by train. Meanwhile, Hatch's new friends descend into a sewer and go to make a pass to the locker room of the prisoner of war camp team. Tens of thousands of spectators came to the stadium, and they were all supporting the prisoner of war team. Renee and her son were also there. When the players took the field, she sent the boy to tell Hatch that the escape would take place during the first break. Steiner was counting on a fair and just game. He gave Colby his word that he would ensure equal opportunities for each side. But the German military brass wanted victory at all costs. When the game began, the prisoners of war took the initiative and attacked the enemy's goal, but failed to score. Then the Germans went to the goal of Hatch, but the latter kicked the ball away. The judge awarded a corner kick and the goalkeeper missed the goal. German commentator at this point turned on a recording of thunderous applause, as if the stadium was cheering for the Wehrmacht team. And listen to that applause. The Germans played hard and managed to score another goal. It was followed by another attack on the German goal, but the attacker was knocked down and carried to the locker room on a stretcher. Another player came on as a substitute. After that, the prisoners also played rough, and the referee awarded a penalty kick. Hatch missed that goal and then another one. The score was now 4-0. With little time left before halftime, Fernandez was injured in another scramble on the field of play. Colby decided to play in the minority because he had no substitute. His players rushed to the attack, but the ball was intercepted and almost scored on Hatch. He fought as hard as Rocky Balboa and was kicked in the head by a German player. While he tried to recover, Colby led his team to the goal and they scored. The stadium was elated but the players were not allowed to repeat their success, time ran out and they were sent to the locker room. Then they saw a hole appear in the pool leading to a sewer. It was the Frenchman who made the move. Hatch wanted to leave, but the others talked him into staying. They couldn't just run away without showing the Germans what they could do on the field. That game means a lot to us. You know that. We must go back. The team had caught wind and wanted to play, and they couldn't do without Hatch. On second thought, he agreed. Hatch played like it was the last time. He was as agile and fast as a cobra and took all the balls. Finally, the prisoners tied the score, but this decisive goal was not counted by the referee. The spectators were furious and so was the team. At this point Fernandez felt better and took the field. When Colby's team once again attacked the opponent's goal, Pele came into Fernandez and he scored while in the jump. At that moment the whole stadium hopped to feet, and even Steiner marveled at the shot. The game resumed, and the referee awarded a penalty kick to the prisoners of war. Hatch stood firm and took the difficult ball. The spectators went wild with joy. They chanted, victory, and tore from their seats. The crowd rushed onto the field and swept the armed soldiers away. The spectators covered the players with their clothes and led them out of the stadium. So the prisoner of war camp team, led by John Colby, escaped. They left the field victorious.